All right, we've gone through the basic anatomy of the heart. We discussed the lining, the pericardium. We discussed the heart chambers. Now I want to deal with how does blood anatomically move through the heart. Uh, and, and then we'll eventually deal with the, the actual uh, forces and pressures that are needed to make that blood circulate through. So first I just kind of want to give you the roadmap, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about how all of it actually functions. So we're going to pick up retracting blood through the heart. So these arrows are going to represent all the blood flows through the heart. The gray arrows are the uh, it is going to be the blood that is deoxygenated or lacks oxygen. The red arrows are going to be the blood um, is going to be the blood that, that has oxygen. So as we come back into the pulmonary circuit, we just oxygenated the blood, so it's represented there in red. I am going to start arbitrarily here with the blood entering to the right atrium. The vessel on top is called the superior vena cava. The vessel on the bottom is called the inferior vena cava. So blood's going to come in through superior vena cava, basically your arms and everything above the heart, from the bottom up from the uh, inferior <coughs> vena cava, and it's going to enter the right atrium. So blood begins to fill up that right atrium coming in from what we call the systemic or the general circuit. And as the blood fills up into the right atrium, eventually the right atrium is going to contract and it's going to squeeze on that blood. Now, in reality, the atria, not atria, atria, both atria contract at the same time. So just kind of keep that in mind, but I'm going to go on one side of the heart and we're going to circulate, circulate through and come back to the other side of the heart. So kind of think about your right a red blood cell right now. What would be your travels through the entire circuit here in the heart? So the atria are going to contract. And as the atria contract, this causes an opening of this valve that's set between the right atria and the left, uh, the right ventricle and the left atria and the left ventricle. So there's valves situated between the upper and the lower portion of the heart. As the atria contract, they squeeze open that valve. That opens up blood and begins to push into the ventricle. The valve there is called the AV valve. It stands for atrial ventricular valve. So blood's going to flow through that AV valve. And since we're dealing with the right side of the heart, blood enters the right ventricle. So blood begins to fill up in the right ventricle. The signal that caused the right atria to contract is now passed to the ventricles, and the ventricles are stimulated to contract. And as those ventricles contract, we induce or increase pressure in the left ventricle. And it's going to be that pressure of the ventricle that's going to close the open AV valve. The AV valve is opened by increasing pressure in the right atrium. Now the right ventricle is increasing pressure by contracting. And what happens is that valve that's open, it actually snaps back shut. Now, there's an issue here that if we don't address, can become very problematic. That valve can open up in the reverse direction. And if it opens up in the reverse direction, I'm just going to spurt blood back into <coughs> the right atrium. So I want to make sure that blood actually goes out through this valve here. So when the valve closes, I have small little muscles that are on the uh, base of the heart here, on the base of the ventricle. And those small little muscles, as the uh, other muscle contracts, those contract as well. Then there are small little cords called chordae tendinae that attach to that valve. And so the valve, the pressure is what shuts it, 
and then those papillary muscles and cordae tendon pull on the, the valve so it doesn't snap all the way back, it just closes. Okay? Um, yeah. So here is the papillary muscles, and then these little tendinous cords here, cordae tendon, holding onto the valve. So as the valve closes, those papillary muscles pull on those flaps and only let them close rather than going all the way back open in the reverse direction. Does that make sense? So the pressure closes the AV valve, those papillary muscles. Cordae, tendinae, are going to pull on the valve. And that reverse flapping of the valve, if that were to happen, that's called prolapse. And so it's going to prevent prolapse. <clears throat> Prevents that valve from flapping backwards, opening into the atrium. Now, at the same time that this valve is being shut, there's a valve here that leads out into the pulmonary trunk. This is going to be the vessel that carries blood to the right and to the left lungs. This valve is going to be forced open to allow blood to leave the right ventricle and enter into the pulmonary circuit. This particular valve here is called the pulmonary semilunar valve. It's a semilunar valve because it looks sort of like a moon. So semi sort of moon, uh, lunar moon sort of looks like a moon. And as blood leaves through the right ventricle, it's going to circulate <clears throat> to the right and to the left to the, the lungs. And that whole circuit there, the blood circulating through the lung tissue being exposed to the alveoli where we have gas exchange, oxygenation, and decarboxidation of the blood, that circulatory circuit is going to be called the pulmonary circuit. <laughs> And as we circulate through the lungs, we are oxygenated. Now, we're going to go through pulmonary arteries, through capillaries, and we're going to come back into the heart through the pulmonary veins. Those pulmonary veins are going to bring the blood back in. Now we see that the arrows are red because we've oxygenated that blood, and they come back in to the left atrium. Now, just like with the right side of the heart, everything that's happening here on the right is also going to happen on the, I'm sorry, that's happening on the left side of the heart is also going to happen on the right side of the heart at the same time, but we're only going to deal with the left side of the heart. So blood comes back in from the pulmonary veins, enters the left atrium. So that left atrium begins to fill up, and it's going to be signaled to contract. So the atria contract again, left atrium contracts. <coughs> this causes the AV valve on the left side. Now the left AV valve to swing open. Blood begins to flow into the left ventricle. Now notice on this figure, as the blood begins to flow here into the left ventricle, the tissue surrounding the left ventricle is the thickest tissue in the heart. Remember we call that tissue the myocardium, 
So this is the thickest myocardium in the heart. So when this myocardium is signaled to contract, which it's going to in here in just a second, when it's signaled to contract, it can generate a massive amount of force and change pressure drastically. So very thick muscle, muscle tissue, and when it contracts, it leads to its forceful contraction. Now, during that forceful contraction, again, increasing pressure in the left ventricle is going to cause that AV valve to snap back shut. We're going to prevent prolapse because of the papillary muscles and chordae tendine. We're also going to induce increased pressure right back here behind the pulmonary artery. We have another semilunar valve leading away from the left ventricle called the aortic semilunar valve. It leads into this big vessel called the aorta. So as we have that forceful contraction occur, we shut and prevent prolapse of the AV valve, we open up the aortic semilunar valve, and blood makes its way out into the aorta, which is the first artery of the general circulation. And I'm going to abbreviate that as the GC. Blood enters the general circulation and it leaves through that aortic semilunar valve entering into the aorta. Now, from there, where does it go? Where does the blood go from the aorta? It's not a trick question. Goes every every place else in the body. Goes everywhere else, right? We're circulating through all of the systemic vessels. So we go interact with the tissue. We have carbon dioxide that's picked up there. The nutrients and oxygen that's delivered into those tissues, the capillary beds, it comes back to the veins through those mechanisms of venous return. Eventually, all of those veins. Uh, come down onto the inferior and superior vena cava and drain back into the right side of the heart at the right atrium and that whole travel, that whole roadmap is repeated, spinning blood back into the general circuit and that's oxygen by the pulmonary So that's the roadmap. Now let's talk about how it actually is going to happen. When we look at the heart, we can model the heart in this model called cardiac cycle. Now, I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. Whenever you see the term cycle, you know that that's just the model. That's the way that our finite minds can look at very complex processes. And this, this process just happens to be cyclical. In other words, there's no real beginning or end. We just kind of have an arbitrary starting place. I could have just told you everything that I just told you, starting from right at this location here, going through everything, and come back to that location. Right? I just happened to choose the right atrium because that's classic before we begin. So the cardiac cycle is basically this roadmap and what's happening to cause the blood to move. Now, I've already alluded to the fact that it's going to be changes in volume of the chambers, which induces changes in pressure. So we're going to go back to fluid dynamics, just like we discussed already in the respiratory system. And with fluid dynamics, you've got to remember that the fluid, it's going to be blood in this case, is acted upon by changing the volume of the chamber, which induces changes in pressure in that chamber. And it's that chamber pressure that imputes onto the fluid, the blood, to cause the blood to flow. So whenever we're looking at a fluid dynamical system, remember that we're always going to be able to predict flow based off of where the high pressure is and where the low pressure is, right? So here is a very basic rundown of what the cardiac cycle is going to look like. 
And really, all we're dealing with here is going to be the contraction and the changes in pressure. There's actually other figures that show the cardiac cycle with a variety of other variables. So if you go and are studying cardiac cycle and type in cardiac cycle on Google, you're going to get this huge model that shows all of these other things, not just the pressure changes and the contraction, but you're going to get the heart sounds. You're going to get the electrical activity inside of the heart. You're going to get all this other information. All I'm really going to have you follow here is going to be a change in the chamber size, the volume, and the pressures that are uh, that are being um, induced by those changes. So the uh, the cardiac cycle is basically dealing with the pulsatile and rhythmic beating of the heart. Pulsatile and the rhythmic beating of the heart. And really, the left and right sides of the heart are going to do the same thing, and we're going to go from top to bottom. So first, the two atria contract, and then the two ventricles contract. <coughs> so here you can see the ventricles contract. When the ventricles contract, what happens to, I'm sorry, not ventricles, atria. Here you can see the atria contract. So when the atria contract, what happens to the chamber size of the atria? Increase or decrease? Decrease. As we decrease chamber size, what happens to the chamber pressure? Increases. So there I'm creating a localized region of high pressure. Inside the ventricles, really nothing is happening. The ventricles aren't changing in size, so we have no change in pressure. So the atrial pressure is going to jump above the ventricular pressure, and I've created my pressure gradient. So if I have high pressure in the atria, low pressure in the ventricle, blood will flow from where to where. High in the atria, low in the ventricle. I'm sorry, say it again. From the atria to the ventricle. Wherever I have my high pressure to where my low pressure is. High in the atria, low in the ventricle, flows from high to low. Now, inside of the heart, you'll notice that right here it says systole, atrial systole. Whenever you hear that term systole, think contraction. Now, you've probably run into that word before. You probably at least run into the word systolic, as in the systolic blood pressure. That's your top number when your blood pressure is measured. Right now it's supposed to be about 110 for normal. Systole is the pressures that are experienced in a chamber when that chamber is contracted. So atrial systole is the pressure in the atria while the, pre well, the atria is contracting. So you'll notice that systole is contraction. If you go just down here to the bottom, you'll see that we actually have this thing called ventricular systole. So there's actually two different types of systole, atrial systole and ventricular systole. Now, they're an atrial systole. The atria both contract simultaneously. So both the atria are going to contract together, or they're going to contract simultaneously. Atrial systole, the pressure that's induced or atrial contraction, pushes blood into the ventricles. If you listen to a heart, pull out a stethoscope and put it right over the heart, most of us, our hearts are going to sound like lumped up, lumped up, lumped up. During atrial systole, that <coughs> love sound is what correlates to the atrial systole. So 
correlates to the bug part sound being bugged up. Now, really, what's happening is the love sound is actually the opening of the valve. The valve pops open and it sort of makes a love, a, a love sound. The second, second type of systole is ventricular systole, and as you've probably been able to guess, this is going to occur during ventricular contraction. So the systole is the pressure in the heart during ventricular contraction, and this is going to correlate to the dub sound. Okay, so it's going to correlate to the dub sounds of the lung. Dub, lung is the atria and the AV valve opening. The dub is the valve snapping back shut and then the semi-lunar valve opening up. In addition, ventricular systole, especially the left ventricular systole, is what pushes blood out into the general circuit. So when you measure blood pressure, your top number, which should be between 110 and 120, 120 over 80 or 110 over 70, you're actually getting an estimated measure of left ventricular systole. In other words, what is the pressure that's induced by the left ventricle, and you're measuring it, you know, about a foot and a half away because you're measuring it right here from the brachial artery, which isn't really too far. You have the aorta that comes off, and as the aorta comes off, there's three vessels that come up off the top of the aorta. One of them is called brachial cephalic, and that eventually leads to the brachial artery. So you're measuring that left ventricular system, or getting an estimate of that left ventricular system about an 18 inch distance distant away. You can actually measure blood pressure in other vessels as well. You can measure it down in the legs, you can measure it uh, in your feet or in your hands if you have the right type of equipment to do that. We just happen to measure it here because this is the easiest place to measure. Okay, so that's systole. You'll notice over here that we have this thing called diastole. And it's just ventricular diastole. There's no atrial diastole. In reality, there is an atrial diastole. It actually occurs right here in this process. And so it's covered up by the action of the ventricle. The ventricle, you can measure if you put an indwelling probe, pressure probe into the chamber. So you go in through jugular or something like that, make your way down into the, into the heart. You can measure pressures during atrial contraction and atrial relaxation. So it's actually there, but if you're just listening to the heart and not very invasive, you can't actually pick up on the atrial diastole. You can't measure it the same way you can measure ventricular systole and ventricular um, diastole. So diastole occurs during relaxation of the heart tissue. And so when we measure the diastolic pressure, again, you're measuring that at the brachial artery, so you're actually measuring left ventricular diastole. What is the pressure inside of the heart when the muscle is not contracting? So basically a risk and pressure inside of the heart. Did I miss a four? I thought four was... No, I was supposed to have a four right here. I was supposed to say two types of systole. So call it a four or call it a five. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, just moving forward, the relaxation, diastole, this is when the chambers relax. You really can only uh, measure ventricular diastole. So we're just going to simply say when the ventricles relax. And during that ventricular relaxation, we're actually going to have passively filling 
passive filling that occurs, the passive filling um, of the left ventricle is occurring during this diastole. And so this is actually where we're going to have this passive filling that occurs as we go towards systole. We're going to have blood that passively flows into, uh, into the, the, the ventricles of the heart from the atria. So really the, the blood flows through without being squeezed through. We're going to need atrial systole for that to occur. We're going to have blood that flows through. I'm sorry, I should be over on this figure. We're going to have blood that flows through, passively filling up the heart and ventricular systole, diastole. Then we're going to move into atrial systole where the heart contracts, squeezing more blood in. So passive filling leads towards more of an active filling to load up the ventricle with as much blood as possible. When you look at the diastole, especially the ventricular diastole in the heart, that period lasts about 50% of the cycle. And then blood will fill up, atrium contracts, squirting more blood in there. Then we're going to go towards this thing called isovolumetric ventricular contraction leading towards ventricular contraction and, and ventricular systole, and then back towards diastole. During this phase here, this phase of the cycle, blood is getting ready to be pushed out. And think of this isovolumetric contraction. Basically, it's contraction where you don't have a change in the volume of blood in the chamber. And think about it as being a rubber band. Pick up a rubber band, and it, as I stretch it out, I'm really initially not changing the length of that rubber band because I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting rid of the slack. And then eventually I start to pull far enough, and then the, 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 uh, the rubber band begins to, to spread out and begins to create a force. Right? So I pick up the rubber band, I'm going to get to a point where I can't generate any force because I'm just pulling the slack out, and then I start, start to generate force as I pull on the rubber band further. The ventricle is going to begin to contract, and it's basically increasing pressure on that ventricle before it can pop open the valves to begin to push the blood out. So the ventricles are contracting, but there's no change in the volume of blood, and there's no real change in the volume of the chamber. It's just sort of keeping the slack out, and then it starts to squeeze. Additionally, squeezing on the blood, the blood begins to flow out into the pulmonary circuit on the right side and the general circuit on the left side. And then we end up into that relaxation phase where blood begins to just passively flow back into the heart. All right, so that's a real brief rundown on the roadmap and then how we're inducing the flow through the heart. It's all about changing pressure, changing volume of the chambers. The last thing I want to talk about here is how we actually stimulate the muscle to contract. It's not just contracting on its own, we actually have to stimulate it, and we're going to stimulate it through some specialized tissue in the heart called the cardiac conduction system. So what you see here in the blue is specialized cardiomyocytes that carry a signal through the heart that signal is what actually interacts with the surrounding cardiomyocytes to cause the muscle to begin to contract. Now the thing that's really interesting about the tissue of the heart and the cells of the heart is they conduct electricity really well. They conduct changes in voltage really, really well. And so the conduction system acts to coordinate those electrical changes inside of the heart and basically to start the electrical uh, change up in the upper corner of the heart and let it flow through and permeate the rest of the tissue. So I want to contract the atria first, so I'm going to have a signal that goes through the atria causing the atrial muscle to contract and then we flow through the rest of the ventricle 
a shorter time after that to squeeze and cause the, the, um, the ventricles to contract. So this electrical coordination is referred to as an autorhythmic coordination. So the heart is said to be uh, autorhythmic or to exhibit autorhythmicity. And what that means is auto self rhythm. It sets its own rhythm. Now, that's not to say that there's not actually nervous tissue that innervates the heart. But if I were to take the heart out and get rid of all of the nerves, the heart beats on its own. As long as I give it the right concentration of ions, electrically charged particles, the heart will continue to, to beat on its own. And in fact, they've done experiments where they'll take a heart from some experimental animal, mouse, or a rat, or something like that, and they'll get rid of all the connective tissue you're just left over in a petri dish with the cells called the cardiomyocytes. And as long as they're given the right concentrations of sodium, chloride, and calcium, and potassium inside of that petri dish, they actually start out and they're all beating kind of at their own rhythm. And then pretty soon they all stick up and they beat together as long as they're given the right, um, the, the right solution. And they'll continue to beat together as long as we can get the pH and temperature and anything basically induced in the cell will just continue to beat together and one what would be called sensational. All together, synchronized together, all generating the own, their own beat, so self-generated rhythm, autorhythmicity. Now that autorhythmicity is typically driven by this location right here. There's a bunch of cells in this part of the conduction system. That's called the sinoatrial node or the sinus node. And the SA node is what would be referred to as the pacemaker of the heart. So this is going to be the group of cells that dictate the speed of contraction of the heart. We call it the pacemaker because it sets the pace. If you lose the SA node, you have to have a pacemaker put in to reestablish this electrical coordination of this electrical code. <coughs> So the electrical impulse that's needed to drive heart muscle contraction is initiated here at this little group of cells that's referred to as the SA node. Now, just like we've seen with muscle, when you charge a muscle cell, if it's skeletal muscle, what happens if I dump a bunch of calcium inside of, of a muscle cell, of a skeletal muscle cell? We have that contraction that occurs. Calcium rushes in, you have interaction with troponin, tropomyosin, moves that out of the way of the actin and the myosin to cause cross-breaking. We see the exact same thing happen here. So that electrical impulse is actually going to charge the cell. Because charged muscle cells contract. So that signal is first generated here, and it spreads along the conduction system and spreads throughout the tissue of both the right and left atria. And as the signal spreads through all that tissue, those cells get charged. Charged cells always attract. The signal is also carried to this location here. It's another small group of cells. It's a node called the AV node, the atrial ventricular node. So this atrial ventricular node is going to receive this impulse that's set by the SA node. The SA node passes it to the AV node. So the signal makes its way to this small clump of cells called the AV node, the atrial ventricular node. And what happens in this AV node is the signal that has just been transmitted in a very short amount of time 
This is your time right here. So about 0 0.03 seconds to get the signal from here to here. It was this signal that caused the atria to contract. So if that signal just continues without delay into the ventricles, the ventricles would contract. And you would end up with the atria and the ventricles contracting at the exact same time. Now that's a little bit of a problem because if the atria and the ventricles contract at the same time, you're never going to create those zones of high pressure and low pressure. Blood's just going to slosh back and forth between the atria and the ventricles and then going to move into the pulmonary circuit or the general circuit. That's a problem. So that AV node is actually going to take that signal and it's going to pause it, allow the ventricles to, to, to contract, and then the signal after it's been paused is going to move into the rest of the conduction system to be dispersed to the rest of the ventricular tissue, causing the ventricles to contract after that short delay. So after our short delay, the atria have contracted, the AV node passes the impulse into the remaining part of the conduction system. So we go through this thing called the AV bundle, the right and left bundle branches, and then we get into this thing called the Purkinje network or the Purkinje fibers. And those Purkinje fibers are those specialized cells of the conduction system that carry all of the electrical activity out to the muscle the, of, of the ventricle, all the remaining cardiomyocytes of the ventricle. So from the AV node, we pass the impulse to the Purkinje system. And those Purkinje fibers end up being charged. And as they're charged, what do charged cells do? They contract. So these charged cells pass the signal into the other cells of the ventricles. And the ventricle contracts. And what happens? Pressure as the ventricle contracts, what happens? Ventricular pressure increases, volume decreases, pressure increases, we create a pressure gradient that is the impetus for flow. All right, the last thing that I want to um, talk about here with the circulatory system is everybody got all, all of this complete unit. The last thing I want to talk about here with the circulatory system um, is what this electrical activity looks like if we're measured non-invasively from the outside of the heart. And you've probably all seen something similar to that before. That's the electrical activity inside of the heart. And looking at that, you can actually determine what is happening inside of the heart and whether or not the heart is functioning at or near normal. So the way that we measure this particular complex, we're going to call it the PQRST wave. And don't think you have to memorize this. This is just the alphabet, PQRST in order. So it's nothing real special. We set up a, a, a thing called an ECG, or an electrocardiogram. And basically, an ECG, or an electrocardiogram, is just a way where we can monitor the electrical activity in the heart. And the signature should look like this when we measure an ECG. And so we get a PQRST wave to represent the normal signature of the electrical events in the heart. Now, those electrical events that occur in the heart should relate to the changes in chamber size, should relate to the changes in pressure. So as long as we see normal electrical activity, we can assume, for the most part, normal heart function. So the very first part here, that first little hill, is called the P wave. And that P wave relates to the electrical activity in the heart during atrial contraction. Okay, so the P wave represents atrial contraction. So a decrease in atrial chamber size, increase in pressure. During atrial contraction, we should 
experience blood spurting into the ventricle. The next part is the QRS complex. And the QRS complex occurs during ventricular contraction. So the QRS complex is the electrical activity in the heart and ventricular contraction. And then finally we have this thing called the T wave, this last little bump here. And the T wave is the electrical activity in the heart during ventricular relaxation. So the atria should contract, the ventricles should contract, the ventricles should relax. What about the atria? Should they relax? They should. Yeah, it's going to be covered up by the QRS complex. Remember that the ventricles have a large amount of muscle tissue. They're the most muscular portions of the heart. And so any electrical activity, any other place in the heart at that time, is going to be covered up by that massive amount of electrical activity in the ventricles. So atrial uh, uh, relaxation actually occurs behind or hidden by the QRS complex. Okay? So why can we use this to demonstrate the, um, the function of the heart? Well, what happens if I don't have a P wave? What if I set up an ECG and I just see QRST? I may not have electrical activity and contraction of the atrium. Or what if I have a bunch of QRS complexes that just are occurring right in a row? I may have atrial contraction and I may have relaxation, but the QRS complex is occurring frequently, and that may be an indication of a reduced ability for the blood to circulate from the ventricles or even into the ventricles. So really, when we use this in a clinical setting, we're looking for deviations from normal. And those deviations from normal actually are going to indicate what may be happening in the heart or certain situations that can be happening inside of the heart. Those are called dysrhythmias or arrhythmias. We want the normal, which is called the sinus rhythm, to always be present. And if we deviate from the sinus rhythm, we deviate to a dysrhythmia or an arrhythmia, and that could be an indication that we have some malfunction in the heart, and we may need to address that medically or uh, with additional testing. Okay. How many of you have ever had an ECG done? I think most of the athletes here now get ECGs done as part of their routine uh, physical at the beginning of the school year. Um, if you had it done, either you just had the opportunity to have it done, or you had a reason to have it done, it'll become routine for you. You go in for your physical and you get a little bit older and we'll actually do a baseline ECG. So if you ever have something that happens, they can always go back and compare it to what is your normal physical and what is your normal physical. Okay. All right, about four minutes left. Let me just get started here on the nervous system, just give you a real quick introduction to the nervous system. Right, so this is a picture of the nervous system, and the nervous system is a series of nerves and neurons and other neurological tissue that starting from the brain and the spinal cord extends to all different locations in the body. And the nervous system is an electrical, electrochemical coordination system. And really it's an electrochemical coordinator between cells and we've already run into the nervous system. We seen the nervous system in scales also. Remember that we had the neuromuscular junction, we had a motor neuron, 
that innervated an individual muscle, and it was a signal sent down that neuron to the muscle that caused the muscle to contract. So it was a coordinating when the muscle cells would contract. And we use it in a variety of other places as well, not just skeletal muscle, but we have a whole series of sensory glands uh, and sensory tissues, including things like your eyes and your ears and your nose, that help out with our general senses, pick up pain, we can pick up um, uh, ch uh, changes in um, contact and things like that with other people. Uh, so all of this is regulated by the nervous system. And when we look at the process of taking a stimuli, so maybe I come in here and I put a sharp pencil, you're going to feel that. So what is the series of events that happens from being poked to perceiving that, hey, I'm being poked and I probably should punch this guy in the face? So what's the basic steps that occur to cause that to happen? And there are actually three basic steps in coordination. And you can see those three basic steps here. You have some sort of sensory input or sensory signal. So in this case, the guy is observing a glass of water. He's like, oh, there's a glass of water. That information from the eyes is sent in as sensory input to an integrating center. This is typically going to be in the brain or a lot of times actually in the spinal cord, which are both part of the central nervous system. We'll get there a little later. That integration center basically is your central processing unit. It takes the information in and it says, okay, this signal coming in, this is a glass of water. And really what's happening is you have photons of light that are bouncing off of that glass. And it's those photons of light that make their way to your eyes. That information gets sent to the brain. The brain interprets that information and says, that's a glass of water, and then it plays a movie for you. Basically, your brain creates your reality. And so then you see a reality where there's a glass of water sitting on the table. Through that integration center, you may make a decision based off of what you want to do with that glass of water. So it sends back a signal to the, uh, into parts of the brain that create the movie for you, the movie that is your reality and we'll send out an input to a muscle in this case, what we call a motor input, where we grab, grab the glass, and then we have all of the right coordination to actually lift the glass up to the right location on our mouth, or our face, mouth, so that we can drink it out, hold it in the eye, or under our chin, or something like that. We're actually coordinating all of that stuff with all of the information that's coming in. So when we come back on next Monday, we'll pick up here with the three basic steps. We'll outline each of those steps in a little bit more detail, uh, and we'll go from there. All right, thank you.